Hey, welcome, Cassie Chun. Glad you're here. Hello, hello. hello. How are you? Good, thank you. What did you bring to drink for Coffee Talk? Coffee, of course. Of course. <laughs> I was telling everybody I brought coffee, but my wife's like, hey, throw some ice cream in, then it becomes an affogato. I'm like, <laughs> Nice. So it's, like, it's still kind of coffee time in Hawaii, but it's past coffee time where you're at. It's always coffee time. True. We're <laughs> True. <laughs> we never stop drinking coffee. It's uh, <laughs> To me, it's, I mean, like coffee comes from a bean. Bean is grown, so it's organic. So really, it's a nutritious beverage. I couldn't agree more. Right, right. That's what I tell everybody. I just, I don't know why people laugh at me, though, when I tell them that. They're just like, <laughs> really no <laughs> uh, I guess it's the added sugar syrups and all of those other things that everyone's like well maybe not but that's the best part yeah that is the best part of all my uh, phone's going off but glad you're here Cassie you got your email too so we'll hopefully get to hit that question so thanks for sending in that question awesome. thank you yeah, that was fantastic. James Tanaka is in the house with the ocean in the background. Hey, how are you doing? Doing good. Welcome, welcome. You had a good week. Yeah, so far so good. So far so good. Lockdown is as good as it was lockdown last week. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Hey, Eric. Eric Co. Hey, what's up, man? What's up? What's up? Where are you located? Ah, uh, Vegas. Vegas. Oh, hey, there. How's it going? Hey, what's up, Corey? No, nah, next time. Oh, we're in Vegas. Oh, we'll sit down or something. Yeah, hit me up. Absolutely. We're just finishing our flip in Vegas uh, tomorrow, actually. They're cleaning the house. Oh, nice. Okay. On Monday. So we're pretty excited <laughs> about that. We were uh, We were hoping to come down and actually check out the finished product, but, you know, it's like this this pandemic apparently you know you can't really go anywhere <laughs> yeah 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 half the city is shut down right here that's what everybody <laughs> said um, i was talking to our um landscaper guy and he's like part-time he works in uh vegas on the strip he's like it's uh -huh. a ghost town it's the freakiest thing he's ever seen oh yeah it's weird uh, i've been here for like over 14 years i've never seen that happen that's so like i just we just like at night we just take our kids and just drive down the strip is like all empty <laughs> just to drive around unbelievable i mean like you couldn't even imagine that but like every single hotel yeah is closed every show yeah, all of them even the local ones too yeah that's amazing yeah. you know what would be freaky is if they actually shut down all the lights that would be freaky oh yeah <laughs> no they stop putting up like these um kind of like a heart shape with like the buildings of different rooms, making into a heart, it's kind of cool. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that too. Uh, we were uh, Zoom chatting somebody. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. But uh, it's weird. <laughs> it's gonna be weird for sure. Hopefully, uh, the economy should bounce back. Hopefully, sooner than later down there. Yeah. I I don't know. I think we might take a pretty big hit, though. I I mean, that's my opinion. You know, always the tourism, touristy places. Yeah. you know but yeah. we'll see well same with oahu we're hoping it'll come back sooner the only problem is that you know with everybody losing their jobs it's going to take a while yeah before they can get money to save up for yeah i think there's a delay though in like you know what i mean like everything is good now because there's still a lot of money from the um, you know coming from the government right i mean they're pretty much printing money so yeah. um, but i think there's a little bit delay we'll, we'll see what's going to happen in like you know two or three months after Absolutely. Well, some yeah. people are making more money on unemployment than they were when. Oh they yeah, were. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like all the Uber drivers. <laughs> I know, right? That's what I actually have a friend. I actually have a friend. Like, oh man, you're making more right now than before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's. Uh, like, life is good. <laughs> yeah. Well, in a way, right? And then other yeah, people. Yeah, in a way. Can't yeah, afford to pay sure. their mortgages. It's like it's super bummers, but. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, we have, um, we're, we're in the middle of a flip. I think Corey, you know, we, we talked to you guys before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we're in the middle of a flip and there's like three adjacent houses and then we're working on one and then the other two, we couldn't get the tenants out. <laughs> so we're like still kind of stand by on that. 
Yeah, you, you technically can't evict right now. No, so it's like we cannot close. We, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty rough right now. Awesome. Well, we're glad you're on from Vegas, and yeah. then we got uh, Tom nice Porter. In the Welcome, Tom. Steve Goodman from Seattle. Good to have you, Greg from Bigger Pockets. Welcome, Greg. Out there, no, out there on Maui. Chris Brown, where are you from? Bowen, uh, Chris Bowen, no R, uh, Seattle. Seattle, welcome, man. Thank you. Beautiful Seattle. Actually, sunshine, a rarity. Not that much of a rarity. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just that when it rains, it really, really, really rains. That's all. Yeah, there you go. All perspective, all perspective. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, there's Leslie, the best appraiser on earth. Welcome, Leslie. Glad you're with us. Chris brought water to drink for coffee talk. Nice. <laughs> Since we're home, I did some yard work today. Oh, yeah. 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 What's up, guys? I thought, I, thought about, uh, I thought about some yard work, and then I, I looked at it a second time, and I was like, oh, that looks like a lot of work. Uh, this uh, is probably the only like the fifth time in the 13 years we've owned this house that I've done any yard work. Right. <laughs> our, our guy just hasn't shown up yet. <laughs> that is so. That is true. I've taken more walks in my neighborhood than I have like in my entire lifetime. I mean, walks just aren't my thing. But I think we're, we know all the neighbors now. It's kind of fun. It's awesome. Right on. Hey, Troy Dennis, welcome. Just Hello. your hair, so it looks good for coffee talk. Hair looks good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's coming out. <laughs> that's a good a, you should see Corey's hair. It's so bad that we told him he had to put a hat oh, on. Oh, take it easy. <laughs> he got the bed head going on. <laughs> longest I've ever seen it. Yeah, it's the corona. Probably the longest it's ever been. <laughs> it's crazy. All right. Well, welcome everybody. It's a couple minutes after, so uh, just glad that you're all on. Happy, uh, happy May. It's May first. Exciting. Hope you all brought some good coffee or something to drink. Uh, welcome to all of you from all over the country. It's kind of cool. Uh, we'll probably have more join us uh, over the next couple of moments, but uh, we just are glad that you're with us and thanks for all the feedback. You guys are amazing. Uh, again, we started the coffee talk really just so we can have similar like-mindedness, share insights, and kind of process through what's going on during this pandemic. Uh, so it's been great to get everybody's input. Uh, obviously, many of us are hit pretty hard. Some of you actually on this call are, are struggling a little bit through this season. And so, um, you know, that's what this call is about is really to network, meet some other people, support each other, um, remind each other never to give up. I mean, it's a tough season, but uh, tough seasons means great opportunities if you allow yourself to really be thinking out of the box. Uh, and what was normal, and what's funny is that we all keep saying we want to go back to normal, and we all want to return to normal. Uh, but, you know, normal is not going to look the same as before, and maybe that, that's okay. Maybe our new normal is going to be even better than it was before. So that's our hope for this call is that, you know, we'll be inspired by somebody else's ideas, and, and what we're going to walk away with is an ability to create a new normal that's better than the past. Uh, hopefully our best days are ahead of us. And so... Um, with that, just thank you so much for joining us and helping us together create a new normal. Uh, today, we, uh, we're structuring it a little bit today because we have a lot we want to try to cover. So many of you have kind of teed up some questions and some thoughts along the way, so thanks for your feedback. Uh, and so as a result, we tried to structure today a little bit so we can hit some of those things. And we felt one of the best ways to hit some of the questions that were coming uh, was to actually kind of do a deal highlight. And so in order to kind of create that context, uh, Corey and I are going to share a little bit about a deal we did in Enchanted Lake on Oahu. Uh, and then that'll just serve as a platform for us to talk about things like acquisitions and financing and permitting and designing uh, and uh, swearing and throwing in the towel throughout the flip, you know, because that's all part of it. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then uh, we're gonna do a little bit of Q&A during that time as well. So that'll give us a chance. Um, so some of you who are newer to flipping, great opportunity to pick not just Corey's brain or mine, but there are some other really amazing uh, flippers, rehabbers uh, on this call. So that'd be a great opportunity. And then we're gonna spend a little bit of time uh, on the hot topic of the day, 
Uh, it is May 1st, and if you haven't heard, there is a national strike against paying your rent. And so there's a movement of hundreds of thousands of people that are today telling their landlords that they will not uh, be paying rent. And so it's causing quite a stir in the uh, market for landlords. Uh, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time kind of brainstorming that a little bit. Um, our property management team is in the throes of that right here in Seattle. So they'll have a chance to share a little bit about what we're seeing. And some of you who have rentals might be able to contribute there. And, and we'll think through together maybe what the best way is going forward on that. Uh, and then we'll end with just a segment we're going to call Gets and Gots. Um, so if you've got something that you need to place or wholesale or give away, um, that would be awesome. Uh, if you have something that you need, then um, that'd be a great opportunity that you need to get something. Uh, maybe you need to get some money. Uh, maybe you need to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. You know, just uh, that'll be the section of time where uh, you can definitely chime in there and that'd be awesome. So, so we'll see how that flows there at the end. And, and as usual, we try to keep this to just a little bit over an hour because we know everybody's time is valuable. Although the big question is, where are you going to go? There's not that many options, right? So in some ways we can hang out for a while. Um, but yeah, again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm going to allow Corey to just kick us off then to talk about this deal that we uh, did and uh, just kind of get ready. If you've done a flip before, this will be an opportunity for you to chime in as well because we'll give opportunities for everybody to share some lessons along the way. Uh, and if you're kind of newer and you've got questions, either throw it in the chat on the side uh, or just be ready to ask it. And then um, we're going to learn together. Uh, every single time I hear a deal analysis, I'm always inspired. Uh, and always get something else out of it. So with that, uh, let's uh, have Corey take it away with uh, Corey, the coronavirus hat guy. Oh, <laughs> uh, thanks, bro. Oh, uh, you know, so, I, love <laughs> I uh, thanks guys for uh, hopping on again. And I uh, kick one. I were thinking like, you know, to, just to spark some conversation, maybe we'll do um, present a deal that we did, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago already, um, out here in Hawaii, um, show you the numbers, how we found it and stuff. And then we can kind of use that to keep the conversation going about, you know, discussions from, from everything from, uh, maybe even appraisals. Cause we have Leslie on, um, uh, we can ask her some questions and, uh, spark some, you know, interest. And I guess if you guys have any questions, we can answer it later because we did, use a couple of strategies that uh, to finance this deal that I don't see many people utilizing, but I, I feel it's very powerful and can give you guys, um, you know, a, a leg up in raising capital, raising private capital. Uh, I have never done a screen share PowerPoint presentation. So I hope this goes well. I just push this button, right? This green button. Here we go. Can you guys see that? Nope. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh, look at that. Gorgeous. Okay. It's about to get even more gorgeous because uh, kaboom. <laughs> uh, okay. There we go. Um, so this property, uh, was 1110 Akumu Street in Kailua, Hawaii. So it's on the island of Oahu. And Kailua is um, known to be a lot more expensive, uh, a little bit higher end. And so finding the deal, we found this deal, it was referred to us by a realtor. It was, uh, I guess you can refer to it as a pocket listing. Technically pocket listings are like gray area, you know, because the uh, clients should go to market and be able to, you know, get, you know, have the, put their, their property out to the open market to be bid on. And, but this was referred to us before the seller um, went to market. Uh, he had to get out fairly quickly. So he wasn't, you know, he didn't care about, he didn't want to sit on the market. Um, it ended up, it did go on market, but we already had it in escrow. And so financing the deal. Oh, by the way, how do I go back? All you right. gotta go back because you gotta let everybody know that that green area uh -huh. in that middle is yeah. in one golfing course. That's the swimming pool. Yeah, so that's this uh, here is the, um, 
the pool and you know it it looks like a putting green but that was quite the issue that we can talk about <laughs> as we go through this but it was a beautiful property it was just um yeah, definitely needed a lot of work and it was lakefront though so you can't swim in this lake <laughs> unfortunately it's uh man-made it's filthy but it does provide a beautiful uh view i heard there's some large barracudas in there too i don't know i've never seen them but um so financing the deal we we used a combination of hard money and private money so keko and i didn't have any of our own money in this deal well um, we stacked our financing <clears throat> we got 80 percent loan to cost so 80 percent of the purchase price and 100 percent of the renovation budget and 8.99% interest, two points. So with the remaining, um, we brought in 280,000 in private money. And that was a mix between uh, private lenders and a equity partner, um, which I, I can talk about equity later uh, if you guys wanna hear about that. So the, pr the total principal debt on the property was uh, 1.224 million, 944,000 in first position and 280,000 in party Pasu second position. Okay, so our monthly holding costs were 10, was $10,542 a month, right? So every month and every day that goes by, we bleed money. So that's why it's so important that you know, time is of the essence and we get things done quickly because we literally lose about $351.40 per day, right? Um, even on Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. right? So um, during this coronavirus and stuff, and if your crew doesn't want to go out or if like in some places in, like in Seattle, where you're not allowed, you're, you know, you're not allowed to do construction, it doesn't matter. We're still paying interest on that loan, right? And these are business purpose only loans and you, we still have to pay that interest. So uh, here's the numbers on the deal. We bought it for 925,000. And uh, I know some of you guys are in different markets, but 925,000 for the house that, well, I'll show you the pictures of the befores and afters, like that's what, how expensive, you know, Hawaii property can be, right? So we bought this house for 925,000. Um, closing costs were $24,024. So that includes points, uh, escrow, title fees. Renovation, our renovation budget was 170,000. <clears> um, that was up from what we initially planned. Uh, our principal debt again was one million two hundred twenty-four thousand three hundred dollars. Okay, took us seven months to get out of this project, closing the closing. So our holding costs was seventy-three thousand, almost seventy-four thousand dollars. Okay, and then on the sales side, um, we had our closing costs at about sixty-seven thousand. Okay, so total costs all in was about one point two six and we sold the property for 1.38. So our net profit was $119,472, not bad, right? Um, when you look at the gross ROI, right? Cause uh, total money spent was about, um, the total principal debt, sorry, was 1.224. So the gross ROI is 9.7%. And um, that's a decent return, right? That's higher than most investment vehicles out there. But uh, as investors, uh, we know how to gain, you know, high returns on our money. That's our job. So we know, I mean, Kiko and I know and that we could give our money. We could have gave that, um, you know, 1.2 million to one of you guys or one of our colleagues to invest and probably pay us 10 to 12% interest, right? When, and we don't really have the risk 
of the deal. So if we looked at the ROI in this sense, would we do the deal again? Uh, I don't think so, you know, because I'd rather be passive. I'd rather give my money to um, Chris, you know, and, and, and have him flip a house, him, you know, and maybe uh, we just sit back, you know, and our money's secured by, a, with a mortgage and we, we collect interest. We, so, but since we utilize and we leverage basically a hundred percent, our return is not 9.7%. It's, um, it's higher than that, right? Because we utilize hard money and hard money, if you can qualify, is basically, they basically have unlimited capital. So that's not what we base our ROI on. So we base our, our ROI on um, our private money. So because our private lenders and our private capital is really what's limited. Uh, so when we look at it from a private money ROI sense, our return is about 42%, right? Because we, we tied up $280,000 in private capital to do this deal, but we made close to 120,000 in seven months. So in that sense, um, this was a great deal for us and we would do it over again and again. So with these numbers, um, this deal, I would say, is an average deal uh, for Keiko and I, if everything goes according to plan and it never does. And, you know, I'll tag you in, Keiko, to talk about maybe some issues that we ran into on the project. <clears throat> but here's a before and after of the backyard pool slash putting green. And um, this is kind of the after photo. This one's a little pixelated because I have to take it from the MLS, but um, we added sod and uh, had to do a lot of work to the pool. Um, we had to shock it a few times because algae kept growing back and I, I can't remember why it did. Do you remember? It just, it just loved it. So it just kept coming back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is the kitchen beforehand and uh, this is after so the kitchen was really large we kept the window we kept the window here we walled this side off on this portion to bring the laundry inside because it was initially outdoors and this is the kitchen from the other view looking out Okay, this is the living room before. The house overall was, uh, you know, it, it had strong bones, like they say, but uh, it was definitely unkempt and kind of hoarder-ish. So this is the living room before, this is the our after. Kekoa did the design work on this one. We kept the sunroofs, that was cool. Uh, this is our master bath. <clears throat> That's our uh, Dequity partner, Joe, Joe Wong. Um, so he invested with us. This is the master after. This is the master bedroom. This is the backyard again. So you see how the pool started to get a little bit algae for some reason. So we have to shock it until we got it right. And uh, Ashley was... Uh, our realtor who sold our sold the house for us when we were done. Ashley, do you remember why the what the reason was? I can't remember why. The uh, yeah. Um. No, it's just because the they didn't treat the pool. You guys didn't have any chemical in the pool, so they just needed to do chemical treatment. And then after that, that stain because that's not the color of the concrete. It's a concrete stain. Um. If you guys do any stain concrete around the pool, it rinsed off into the pool. So then there was a layer of oh. stain oil on top after we got the allergy issue resolved. Yeah, I remember we had to keep like pumping it out and treating that pool as a became a nightmare. But um, one thing like if I could do, if we could do it over again, this here is the lava, um, I think, what is it called? The lava veneer rock or something. 
So um, it's supposed to be like more luxurious um, and it's, uh, it's more expensive. And looking back, we probably should have just put the white coral, um, which is cheaper. And I think it would have made it pop a little more. So that was something that, you know, after installing the, the lava, we were like, oh man, that was, we, we probably should have just went with the cheaper white coral. But um, we ended up moving the front door because um, it didn't really have a front door, this house. Um, and we added a bedroom on this one. So we moved it to the front. Keikoa had a great idea to build this out. I was against it at first. I was just gonna say, so something's really, one funny thing to talk about when you ever partner with a friend or you have a team member, uh, Corey and I typically disagree on almost everything design, like 100,000% we disagree. He tends to like things just as it is. Like when we walk into a house, he's like, leave the kitchen, leave the door, just renovate as is. And I'm like, it just doesn't function. We got to move doors and we got to expand this. And so, so we always argue over, you know, where placement should be. But, but I think what's great is if you can find a partner that you can agree to disagree, but then yet you have a massive level of trust, then it's cool to just say, okay, I, I gave uh, my input. Uh, and so Corey was always awesome. He'd be like, you know, I disagree, uh, but go do what you got to do. And if we can't sell the house, then you're buying it. So, you know, it didn't turn out so bad oftentimes. You know, fun fact, um, like in our, me and Kekola's partnership agreement uh, across the board in our companies, uh, if we have a disagreement between each other that we absolutely can't, uh, you know, mutually agree then we result to uh, like in Hawaii, we call it John Kenapo, you know, but rock, paper, scissors to decide. <laughs> so it sounds silly, but honestly, it's a good way to neutralize what could be a very um, tense discussion, you know? And uh, so we haven't had to pull that car yet, have we? I don't uh, think so. I don't know. I think I did in my head when I was mad enough at you, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, keep going forward. You got, do we have a couple more photos here and then we can uh, do yeah, some. So this is the after of the front. Um, this is the front door. This is the pool before and after. That was gorgeous. And this is the back. And that's Ashley, our, um, our realtor. And Joe Wong. And Joe Wong. There's Joe. That's awesome. Um, maybe just go back to one slide of the interior, um, like the kitchen or something like that. Um, and then let's just let's just kind of do a couple conversational pieces. There's quite a few other really experienced uh, flippers uh, on the team or on the call here. And so um, let's start with just acquisition. So we purchased this one. It was slightly off market, um, pocket listing. Uh, that turned out to be a good source for us. MLS was a decent source for some of our deals. Anybody else have any other sources that you're um, exploring for your deals in this season that is working for you? Um, and think particularly maybe on a new flipper, you know, what are some of those sources that they should be considering? Anybody want to chime in on that one? Okay, I'm going to call on somebody. Richie. What do you guys do? Hey, what's up, everybody? Yeah, so right now, still, like you said, MLS is still a great source. Um, they're keeping an eye out on, on the auctions and foreclosures. And uh, I still got <clears throat> friends and family, little cousins that's out and about that's keeping their eye out. So the normal, I guess, nothing special yet no mailers it's just been pretty good with the uh, networking and deal flow that's awesome jared galdi on the chat is saying that junk haulers is a cool creative way to do um, relationship building uh, junk haulers appraisers um, so we've actually gotten some deals from appraisers who drive around and do appraisals and they do pre-appraisals of pre-listings uh, i just uh got wind of one just here locally from an appraiser as well. So those are always good sources for you. Uh, anybody else on this one? Otherwise we're gonna move on a little bit or throw it up there. Door knocking, when I was um, back in my grunt days, I would drive by and I would just always have my card with me and I would just stop into any fixer upper. If I was looking at a property and I saw something distressed next door, knock on it. 
and uh, then target specific houses I would write down door knock. That's awesome. Tom Porter says estate sales. That's awesome. Eric's uh, doing direct mail right now. That's working. Uh, Tomas talked last week about some SMS text blasts. That's working. We have a VA in the Philippines that's actually uh, doing some follow-ups for us. So it's cool. Steve Goodman uh, leverages his children uh, for deals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So let's talk about after you find a deal. So just kind of walking through the process. Um, you know, a lot of us, once we find a deal, we go in and we evaluate the deal and we think about financing. Um, so when um, Corey and I find a deal, our first step is that he and I show up usually together. Uh, Layla now shows up oftentimes to the deal at the very first opportunity we get. Uh, and we walk around the building, we start developing a scope of work, trying to understand what that budget might look like to ensure that we're not overpaying. The deal is made in the buy is what everybody says, but I would argue that the deal is also made in making sure that you don't go over budget and the deal is also made in choosing the right contractor and the deal is also made in having the right financial partner. So, so the deal really can go bad in a lot of different ways is what I'm sharing. Uh, but there is the point is that buying it at the right price is important. And especially I would say, and I'll, I'll let others chime in, if you're newer to the space, be really careful on the front end when you're looking at properties to ensure that you're taking a great contractor that you trust uh, to walk the property. Uh, that works for Corey and I. That's usually when I start kind of brainstorming ideas. And that's usually when Corey starts walking away because he thinks it's going to get way too expensive. Uh, so that's a kind of a fun time, but our contractor that we bring on site usually is able to give us some pretty good numbers. Having your realtor be present as well is always nice because they're keeping in mind what that property would be worth down the road. Obviously in today's market, it might be a little more challenging to estimate that, but um, that works for us. That's usually our first steps. Um, other flippers on the call, anybody else have any other things they do immediately after they get a property? What do you do to evaluate the deal? Don't I, yeah, I think um, for me, it's like during that acquisition phase, and what I mean by that is like when we're looking at the deal and a con, you're under contract, you're, um, you have so many days during your inspection period, I, I'm doing the same thing as well, but also bringing in during that time um, more than one contractor, just to make sure that your scope of work, when you're going out there and you're building your scope of work, that the numbers that you're coming up with the rehab site try and bring in as much contact as you can during that inspection period. Because even if the numbers don't work out that you're under contract with, now you have justification to go back if it's an MLS deal and justify that these are all the prices that these contractors are coming with that you have to either get a credit reduction, a credit, you know, a reduction, price reduction or some type of credit given. So that'll help out rather than somebody, they looking at you and saying that, ah, I'm like a low baller. You're like, no, I brought out all of these contractors and unfortunately there were these. I can, I can elaborate. I can elaborate a little bit more on all of that too. Yeah, can you hear me? As well as bringing out the contractors, you're gonna do that? Go ahead, Indar. No, no, you do a great job. But you know what I just, I was just thinking about is yeah, I started so noticing just contractors. People and what I mean by that is that your numbers, when you run your own number. No. I think we're, I, it can't hear me. For some reason, uh, you're chopping up for some reason. And now he's not responding. Indar, you had a quick note to jump No, in. I was going to elaborate on that a little bit more as because I've been flipping for a while now and I've been through a lot of contractors as well is, um, hate to say it, but uh, contractors get greedy after a while. Um, I actually have a project today and I got a quote from my normal go-to everyday contractor. His prices all of a sudden jumped up higher. You know, I've been through contractors before and they, they almost think, um, I hate to say it like this, but the, they think um, you need them. And so I, I often have to just stick to my numbers, stick to my prices that I, you know, projected uh, this rehab budget to be with. And uh, as well as a little ninja tip, um, you know, do just a labor rate with your contractor and then you take care of materials. You know, it's a good little trick to uh, get your prices down lower. But um, 
And a little one more tr trick, if you guys want a good contractor, uh, go to Home Depot, put a sign up saying contractors needed, you'll get your phone blown up. Or just go to Home Depot and, um, uh, you know, take pictures of all the guys with the bus up trucks and the pukas and the t-shirts. Those, those are the kind of guys, you know, I like to work with. Um, they're cheaper, they're more um, hungry for the work. You know, the guy with the nice truck, you got to pay for his office, you got to pay for his, his uh, staff and his overhead. Um, and that's because that's I, what I used to do before this is I would bid more because we had more of an overhead. That's awesome. But, uh, yeah, that's that's yeah. fantastic. Great advice for somebody just getting started and doesn't know a contractor. Definitely vet out the Home Depot people, kind of make sure they're either legal or at least know what they're doing. That always helps a little bit. <laughs> uh, Serena Norris, I'm going to call on you. I see you on this there. You're sitting back enjoying. Serena's up here in the Seattle <laughs> area. Hey, Serena. She works with hey. Fixated. Uh, she is the design guru and acquisitions uh, follow-up. So after they find a property, get it under contract, she is the first one on site, sometimes in hazmat suits. Um, so <laughs> tell us, uh, Serena, tell us just from your vantage point. I mean, you guys have done a couple hundred flips now. Uh, what do you look for uh, when you guys first walk in? Talk maybe specifically for kind of the newer folks that are thinking about uh, doing this. Yeah, so um, definitely. Uh, thanks, Kiko. Um, Yes, so uh, I wanted to piggyback off of what uh, uh, Keone uh, Wright said. I think uh, he had some great insight on, on that. I would like to say, like, especially if you're just beginning, um, we found that having the most accurate scope of work um, as possible helped really keep costs down. Um, you know, your, the contractor bids might end up bigger in the beginning, but then you're, you're going to end up avoiding uh, more change orders on the back end. So making sure that you have as much as possible predicted within your scope of work. When you're newer, it's harder to see what all those scope of work items are going to be. You know, you have to learn like just exactly what to look for like throughout the whole project. And so what we would do um, in the beginning years ago was, uh, was we would walk the property with as many contractors as possible or hire an uh, an inspector, like a home inspector, and say, hey, I don't need a report or anything like that, but for, you know, a small amount, can you just walk it with me and then tell me what I need to be aware of? So, so he would go in and be like, oh, there's rot here, there's this, there's this, and so he'd point out a lot of different things that we may have not seen or thought would be an issue, um, especially more in the crawl space or attic, etc. And so, um, and then so by walking with multiple GCs and contractors and inspectors, we we're able to make a full scope of work um, and be really prepared. And I think when you have uh, a detailed scope of work and you're going to a contractor, there, I think that you have a chance of them like less taking advantage of you because they assume like you know more of what you're doing. Um, and uh, and so that that would be one thing to um, and then also vet vet out contractors as well. Like if you're walking through with them and and they don't see all those things that you know of. Um, That's great. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Serena, just a quick question <laughs> came up on the chat on the side. Do you folks um, actually ask for GC's license, insurance, bond information? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, we uh, we don't hire anyone who's not licensed, um, and we require a W nine uh, license, insurance, and bond before anyone starts. Um, that's great. And that's just because I mean you can take risks, but you know if you get audited, which is a huge long process that we've gone through, and um, or if anything liability happens, you know, you don't want to be responsible for that and workers comp, right? So you, so I would go even one step further and, uh, uh, sorry, my dog's whining over here. Um, one step th further is get uh, workers comp waivers. Um, and just to, just to make sure that uh, you're covered where the um, contractors, that the people that are working for the other contractors on your site don't, come looking for workers' compensation if they're not able to get it from their worker, right? You're the next one on the chain. Um, so do that and also uh, lien waiver releases when yeah. work is done. That's awesome. In fact, Chris Brown just asked about lien releases and um, yeah. yeah, that is super important. Um, and you guys do that in all cases? Um, we, 
I wish we would do it more, um, but we've we've like established really great working relationships with a lot of contractors. Um, so I definitely in the beginning we used to do that a lot, especially when we we're working with people that we didn't know. Um, but now, like we we document so much um, that we do that less in our pro process. But I still would advise anyone to do it for everything. That's awesome. That's good stuff. Thanks, Serena. Thanks for being yeah. with us too. It's great. Um, so yeah, so we're talking a little bit about just kind of how you assess the property. A great question from Lauren came up just about, or Clayton came up about, you know, is there a, a concern about losing the property uh, before, uh, losing the property during the time where you're doing the scope of work and you're evaluating and you're thinking about which general contractor, you know, what's the risk there of possibly losing the property during that juncture? Um, anybody want to, anybody else that's a flipper want to try to hit that one at all? Hey, Kakoa, it's Tom Porter. Can you hear me now? Um, can you hear you? Go for it. Oh, man, I actually got my computer working this week. Hey, um, yeah, just a little bit of input on that. It's not necessarily a, a good plan for someone who's brand new, but someone who's more experienced. I mean, we're going in, in Cincinnati here. My contractor that did all my rehabs when I was doing it before, I'm working as an agent primarily now. Um, he's actually buying the houses to rehab. So we're going in and uh, and we do a no worse than number. So we'll go walk through a house and and just very conservative. I mean, shoot high on everything. And if you're very conservative, you've got some padding built in automatically, right? And then you'll build in and even a contingency on top of that. Um, and we're going in just doing cash, no inspection, boom, offers. So you, you can't, then you can't lose it. Um, so we aren't tying them up with like inspection periods. And frankly, this, the, the houses that we're buying here in Cincinnati right now, I mean, we're, we just bought a house that was listed at 299 for 235. So we got a substantial discount on it just because it was it was cash, closed in 10 days, no inspections, and then you don't have to worry about that. Now, are you getting a thorough inspection? No, you're not. But again, someone who's brand new probably want to have an inspection, but or at least go through a more thorough scope of work. But we're looking at enough houses that there's no way I could ever, my contractor would never even go through and do an entire scope of work on every house that we just look at. Um, yeah. we're, we're, just we're, we're just going all in and being very conservative about the numbers as we walk through. So yeah, that's good. Well, I think, Tom, what you said in the beginning is really important. I think Serena would agree, too, since she's on the design side as well, is sometimes when you're brand new, you want to dial in deeper and you want to do a scope of work and you want to get everything you can listed out because you need to know what a toilet paper holder is going to run you. You need to know what that stove is going to run you because, you know, those things add up and, and it's really scary if you're under budget and um, that, that really can hurt you in the end. But it also makes a difference when it comes to your uh, financing as well. So uh, let's talk about that. So you found a, you found a property you like, uh, you know, you got a couple GCs out, uh, you got it in kind of escrow, you got an inspection period, so you're not going to lose the property, you get a response back, time is of the essence, and then now you're trying to figure out how you're going to finance this thing. Uh, Corey talked a little bit about Dequity uh, on the one that we did at Akumu, which is a really creative way if you've got some good relationship partners. Um, Corey, can you just break it down one more time? We've got a couple questions in the chat about how Dequity truly works. So uh, just give us another quick glimpse of what that looks like. Right. Yeah. So Dequity um, is a mix between debt and equity, right? So you have a um, what we have been doing uh, and offering to our private investors is we'll give them a certain return, you know, maybe 10, 12 percent interest um APR and so or we'll give them equity um, we'll give them equity on top of that and the way we determine their equity is based off of our projections so uh, for example let's say someone invests a hundred thousand with us and we're going to pay them 12 percent um interest that means if we per month that investor should be getting about a thousand dollars per month on their money right so if we stand if we project that our project's going to take six months uh then their projected earning before the, the start of the project is six thousand dollars okay so we would take that and divide that into our projected net profits so let's say we're just to make things easy we're ex projecting we'll make a net profit of a hundred thousand dollars at the end of six months then we would take 
the interest they would earn the the six thousand dollars and divide that by the projected net profit to determine their equity so in this case it would be six percent okay so that investor we will offer them a equity partnership of 12 percent interest apr and or it's or six percent equity in the net profits um so the benefits of offering equity to an investor is they get the potential upside of equity in their six percent with the security of having a debt position so they still get a promissory note uh, a mortgage right which gets recorded against their the property as their collateral um, but they also have the potential upside of the six percent equity so they will get paid 12 percent interest apr or six percent equity of the net profits whichever is higher at the end of the deal so it's not both it's whichever is higher at the end of the deal so let's say it does take us six months and we net a hundred thousand then it's basically equal right so but if we take a year and the project didn't go as planned and we lose money or we make ten thousand dollars instead of a hundred thousand then their interest is worth more so they'll make twelve thousand dollars still right because they're making twelve thousand or twelve percent apr a thousand dollars a month on their hundred thousand dollar investment um but if let's say it takes us three months to get out of the project and we make hundred fifty thousand dollars net profit then their equity portion um tr like supersedes the their interest right so the six percent in equity will be worth more so they'll make i think that's nine thousand i hope that's right nine thousand in three months and whereas if they were just a debt lender at 12 percent, they would have made three thousand right because we did it in three months and they're making a thousand dollars on their investment per month does that make any sense at all it's hard to uh explain equity without having it drawn out but hopefully you guys caught that that's awesome so um kind of a question can you do a and or so could you do a private money lender on a deal and equity and hard money could it be a combo yeah um that's you can definitely do that that's what we did on akumu and the way you do that is you just make sure that your um your second position note or mortgage is a shared it's shared if you want to keep them you know in a shared second position and the way you secure basically a equity partner is the promissory note and the mortgage um, which secures them on the debt side okay and to secure them on the equity side it's a partnership agreement so there's just an, an additional document that you have with um your equity partner um so they'll get promissory note mortgage and a partnership agreement which details their the entire agreement of what the deal is right 12 percent interest annually or six percent equity of the net net profits, whichever is higher at the end of the deal. That's awesome. And the reason why that, that's a powerful strategy is because again, they get the security of being a debt lender with the potential upside of the equity in the deal. And it doesn't cost you much. It's not, you know, it's not much of a difference when you put it out on paper. That's awesome. I put uh, Corey's email address too in the chat in case anybody wants to kind of get that formula one more time or trying to get some more questions on that. It's a little complicated, at least it sounds like, but it's actually fairly straightforward. Uh, and it really for Corey and I, we reserve that for maybe more of our first tier investors, people we know, people that uh, we really want to give them an opportunity to uh, make a little bit more money. So, so it's just one of those, another kind of a clever way to do creative financing. So, 
Uh, obviously, let's, uh, we got hard money. We, you know, that's always an option. Um, I think that's probably pretty good on the financing side. Um, so then, you know, then you got the rehab. I think most of us, well, before we hit rehab, let's talk about ARV. Super important in this season, uh, especially with COVID. When you're going into a, if you're a brand new flipper, and even for us experienced ones, we got to always make sure that we're not overestimating the ARV or it'll throw everything off and it'll make the reality of selling it later uh, pretty tough. Uh, so ARV, I think Corey and I are right now are looking at more, looking at what the comps used to be. And let's just see if anybody else is doing something similar. And we're actually just estimating a 10% drop from the most recent comps. Uh, and then using that probably more as our ARV and being a little more conservative on ARV. And then we're looking at buying not at the 65 or 70. We prefer the 55 to 60 now percent of ARV. Um, anybody else using a formula that's similar or a little bit different? Or how are you calculating ARV in this season of the pandemic? Well, we should also, um, uh, is Leslie still on or? Oh yeah, is Leslie our appraiser on? She, she perhaps some. I she, was work, she was working, Kako. I think she's going into a job. She should be out in a minute. Oh, okay. She's doing an actual appraisal. Anybody yeah. else got uh, any other flippers and any other criteria that you're estimating ARV? Because ARV is such an important piece of the evaluation process. Oh, by the way, ARV stands for after repaired value. Thank you for that question in the private chat. Uh, after repaired value is an estimate of what you think your project will be worth after all the repairs are done. So if you will, what you think the appraiser will appraise it for. Uh, also what you think the market will bear when you go on market and what a customer would pay for it. That's your ARV value. Uh, and much of the financing in the flipping space, hard money, ba is based off of ARV. Typically in the past, it's been about 70% of ARV. Um, but now I think some are trying to be a little more conservative. Uh, but that's a great question on ARV. I want to ask uh, Keone on this one. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a couple of things to that. When it comes to ARV, um, I also, I guess I would put out there is that, yes, you want to look at it. Make sure you're comparing apples to apples, yeah? So um, for those, obviously, you know, our newbies and coming in, and what I mean by that is that if you're looking at a three-bedroom, one-bath, single level, single family home, and you're going on comps and then you're, make sure you're comparing to a three bedroom, one bed, but not just that, but make sure that the interior square footage along with the exterior square footage is apples to apples or in the same ballpark. Um, I run into a lot of people who talk to me about that. And we, when I look at the deals and then I assist, you know, just running numbers, then I, I run the comps on my end. It's not apples to apples. It's like a three bedroom, one and a half. And then the house that they're looking at right now is like only 800 square feet. And then they're seeing something that's selling and it's like 1500 square feet interior. So that makes a big difference in, as far as ARV. Also, if you're planning on adding square footage, adding another bedroom, another bathroom, then that's gonna affect your after repair value, right? So even though your number might look small, make sure that if you intend to add square footage, then that's another thing that's going to help you out even more. But the problems now is going to be DP, DPP, right? Getting all those permits. And again, when we do what we do, it's making sure that you're on time and on budget. And unless you have those insights, you know, as far as, you know, the old boy networks, um, you can't really control when that permits are going to get done and allow you to get up to a certain point until those inspections are allowed. Yeah. And now you're on the map. So, I don't know if that makes sense, but it does help out on the ARV. And I, I would recommend that if you are planning on adding square footage, going from a 3-1 to a 4-2, yes, definitely those numbers that you're looking at, be conservative as what it is right now, because that's what the appraiser, especially using hard money, they're looking at that. But in your scope, they got to know that we're going to be adding all of these structures. So now they got to compare, like, what is a 4-2 on the after is going to look like for that number? Um and that will only help you out. But again, the timing when you're taking down a deal may take longer on the permitting side, but it'll be worth it on the value side. Hey, uh, Keone, so I know you're buying um, some flips right now in the midst mm -hmm. of the pandemic. So what formula are you using? You know, what ARV minus what percent? And then are you minusing rehab to come up with the I know we're asking for your uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken special sauce recipe, but 
what uh, <laughs> what formula are you using? Because we all, you know, every one of us are wrestling with that right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm still wrestling it as well. I'll be honest, you know, and the reason why is I, I'm not in a position right now to use 100% um, PML. If, if I could, that would be my, my all cure. Um, you know, initially when I got in, I, I truly understand when I broke in with Corey guys, I mean, they were just 100% private money and like having those lenders on hand. So you didn't have to worry about percentages and, you know, like all of these things and interest rates. I'm not there yet. Um, but I am actively searching out to try and take down an entire deal with just private money, especially in Hawaii. It's a little difficult because that's a lot of capital that you got to raise. But those terms are working out better, obviously, right now because of this pandemic that you have to deal with the HML. And just the points up front is just crushing. So, um, sorry. That's awesome. But, uh, what I'm trying to get at is that the numbers I'm struggling with because I still have to use HML hard money lenders up front. So I'm constantly like picking Corey's brains and going out there and talking to other guys. Like, what does it look like on this specific deal? Because my concern is having to bring in so much money and how do much I got to cover myself, you know, like pad everything. And that percentage is just cracking at me. So going back to your question, like, yes, ARV, if I'm looking at a deal, I use the most conservative always have, and I recommend everybody always does, but it's the purchase power. It's like, okay, if I got to buy it this low, how much money I got to bring in? What is that percentage? I'm really analyzing the deal. Like how much am I like, even if I'm using my, um, my private guys to fund, you know, like cover some of the purchase costs. Like if I'm getting 80% LTV on the front end, then that means obviously I got to cover that 20. But now it's like that chunk is getting eaten up by the three points that I'm getting charged up front. I'm getting charged by the interest rate that used to be at like this amount that I'm on. I'm on now it's all double digit. So all of that is stacking against me and I'm tussling with that. And now I'm at a position where even if I run the deal, I'm almost like not confident in pulling the trigger where I just go back and I run the numbers and then I try to explain to the potential sellers, this is where I'm at. The number that I ran after I went in and looked at how I started out analyzing the deal. I went in with my contractors and then I try and bring that number even lower. But again, always justifying and not just lowballing, yeah? Just trying to justify the pricing to buffer, budge factor, giving us the enough cushion to withstand not just market stuff, but handling what the cost it is up front. Hopefully that's making sense, but I don't have that formula. If I do it, I, I'm an open book, but I'm still tossing and turning, trying to figure out, but I'm, for me, I'm just padding and like just trying to create so much margins. And I think we talked about that, but like just thick margins to take down a deal to withstand all of that. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody knows. So I think like saying you don't know is actually, a good, that's why we're asking, you know, like we want to know what people's opinions are. Cause like, I'm like, you own it. Like we don't know, but better to be safe than sorry. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I, I can add a little bit to that too. Um, so, I mean, like Keone said, I don't have a formula yet, but I mean, I can do, I'm still comfortable with like 65 and 70. And the reason being is, uh, um, when I first started, I would use hard money, but not for construction. I would bring in my own funds for construction and I treat myself as a really cheap lender. So I'm slowly kind of going back towards that way to where I could use hard money as a, um, acquisitions and then treat myself as a cheap lender and I, I can create more margins that way. And what also that does for me is, of course, we don't like having our own money in our deals, but during that time, it gives me opportunity to raise funds from PML and bring them in without a rush. And I can be patient and don't need to rush them in and I can keep the project going, move the project along because I have the funds to do it. And, and if a lender does come in, then they don't stay in for that long and it doesn't cost that much. So uh, that's, that's what I've been doing to still pay a little bit more for the properties and still make a good amount. Yeah. Kakoa, Leslie just uh, texted me. She's on now. So she can get some great insight being she's like the best appraisal down the island. So Leslie can talk. Gotcha. Where's Leslie? I'm here. Can you hear me? I'm driving. So. Sorry, I'm not actually 
um, totally present. But you know what? We do not know what's going to happen with this. I think that um, we're going to see a pretty big impact from this pandemic with people not having any money. Um, but we don't know yet. But my biggest guess is, yeah, there's going to be some good buys out there, but I don't know about selling them. Um, you guys probably have a better look out on that than I do. And um, right now, because you're on the front lines, I'm on after it sells and what's going on. That's great. Any other final thoughts anybody got on just kind of what formula you're using and then we're going to kind of move on? Yeah, yeah, I say so. Bingo. Mine's not it's about more, a formula. Mine's more of tips for the ARV. Serena's got some tips for the ARV. Serena, go, and then we'll go next after that. Okay, so with fix edit, I also list our flips. Um, so I'm the like in-house broker for us. Um, I would say it all depends on your area. Uh, some areas are being hit much harder than others. Obviously, if they're more blue blue collar workers or service industry workers, where they're not working right now, um, I would take a look at the area and then start looking at the days on market for listings. Mm -hmm. If they're taking longer than usual, that means there there might be less buying power out there. Um, and just talking to agents and going, hey, are, are buyers are, are buyers active? Are there a lot of buyers? There's still a lot of buyers here in the Seattle area. Um, and so, so we're not too worried about that for multiple reasons is usually our flips are vacant properties. So people are less worried about um, going into houses and being infected um, and they're much easier to show. Um, and then also like when you're looking at the numbers I would be really careful to say you're comparing apple to apple to apples with houses, but maybe before the COVID happened, there uh, were like multiple offers on maybe some of the properties. So say they were listed at 400 and then ended up selling for 430, but that was before COVID. I would be really careful to base the ARV off of that 430 and see and see are there multiple at least three comps that would now justify that higher value or was it just because they got multiple offers and now that market can't support that competitiveness um so and so if there aren't more than three comps that justify that big jump um or that uh, that competition before covid then i would probably take more of the um what it was listed at before uh, another tip is always be conservative with your arv it doesn't matter covid or not we're extremely conservative. We end up listing way more than we thought that it would um, just with appreciation happening with um, in the market throughout. We're really lucky that we're still appreciating here. Um, but, but also it's just because we're really, cons really conservative. Uh, we're making sure to look at like what, if we're, if we're comping like a three, one, well, what was that fully remodeled three, one, what was the lowest that it sold for and be like, okay, well, there's ones up here, but there's this one, and why would ours be so different? So instead of just saying, well, well, three one sold for this, and and so that's the top that we can get it. It's like, no, you got to look at all of them and kind of balance and compare the property. Um, so just be really conservative in the numbers. Um, I agree with what uh, Greg said on the chat. He said he's the licensed appraiser, no longer practicing. Says that he doesn't see an issue at this point. Whatever the comps say is the value. The market value doesn't change until the comps start selling for less. I, I agree with that um, and, uh, and that, um, that I think that you can put a value on what's showing there in the market because that's what appraisers will be looking for. Um, so as long as there's buyers in the area and things aren't staying for on the market for much longer, um, I would say just be considered in your numbers and not, um, I, I think there's still, there's still value there. Like there's still proof you can, awesome. you can use comps. That's awesome. Thanks, Serena. This is great. Hey, I know that we're, uh, we've got so much participation on this particular topic, which leads um, us to want to spend a little bit more time in the coming weeks. So would you do me a favor? Any questions that you're thinking about relative to fix and flip, will you throw them in the chat right now? Uh, we're going to jot those down and then we'll start kind of forming uh, a little bit more detailed conversations around certain topics. I mean, we didn't even get to dive into how permitting works. Uh, how do you fire a GC? Corey and I have had to do that before. Uh, there's just a lot of things with the flips. Uh, Design-wise, you know, how do you pick colors and how do you pick cabinetry? There's so many interesting things. So throw those questions in on the chat right now. Uh, I want to spend a couple minutes, and we're, we're a little bit over two o'clock, but just a couple minutes on the topic of what's happening right now across the nation. So we're going to switch gears. 
this is a pretty hot topic because it is absolutely relevant as of today, May 1st. Uh, as many of you know, across the country, there are rent strikes happening. Uh, and these rent strikes are really designed to inspire everybody, whether they are paying rent or unpaying rent or haven't paid rent, whether they have the ability or don't have the ability, there is hundreds of thousands of people that are predicted to be a part of this movement today that are just going to choose to walk out on paying rent. Uh, so it's kind of a really dramatic time that we're in. And if you're a landlord, obviously that's a little bit stressful. And so this conversation that we're having here on this coffee talk um, is going to be extremely relevant because there's several of us on this call today that are landlords uh, or we're tenants. And so I uh, wanted to just chat a little bit about this, see if anybody's got any insights from what you've heard uh, in regard to uh, this particular episode. And I know that we don't want to necessarily ask for a show of hands, but I'd be curious if anybody's bold enough. Does anybody want to say that you're going to be a part of this in terms of like you're just choosing not to pay rent? Uh, this month? I know that's a bold question, but if anybody wanted to, I'd be just curious. There's no, no judgment. It's just, it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting deal. I'll be honest. I thought about it. I was like, Hey, can I, can I get out of paying mortgage for a month? This would be great. That'd be extra money. You know, you could save it up for extra coffee or something like that. But uh, you know, the, the scary part of this is that nobody knows, you know, are you going to have to repay it right now? The law says you do. Um, you know, a third of the nation didn't pay April rent. So it's looking like it may be higher this month. Um, but um, give, a, give, give us some feedback. Anybody got some feedback on this just in general on what you're hearing about this topic? Who has tenants? I know, I know that, let me look at this. I know somebody. I just, um, I had a tenant. Hey, Greg. Pay, uh, hey, guys. Um, I, I just had a tenant yesterday. They paid uh, double rent. They paid for May. What's this? What? May and what? May. <laughs> Who does that in this season? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I've, I've, I've um, out of six units, I had three, I think, that are paid. So today is the first. We'll see if the other three come in. Gotcha. So Greg, actually, I'm gonna put two you on of them the usually pay on the third, so that's we'll, we'll have to wait to see for those. But it's looking, it's not too bad so far. So Greg, what would you do? I'm gonna put you on the spot here for just a couple seconds. What would you do as a, a landlord? Let's say you got noticed today by text. Uh, one of your tenants just says, "Hey, uh, I'm joining the movement. I'm not gonna pay my rent this month." It's kind of off the cuff. What how, what would be your response, and what would you try to do? <clears throat> Man, that's a tough one. Um, I would, I would probably initially be angry, <laughs> but I wouldn't respond to them. I would like calm down, you know, like kind of let it process, right? And then I would call them up and say, try and work with them and figure out what's going on. Why are they wanting to do that? Like, are they, you know, like one of my tenants, his wife lost his job, so they're on a lower income. Um, Hey, are you, what can you pay? Because this is not going away. And um, if you don't pay now, you're going to end up paying. You're either going to end up paying or being evicted. It's one or the other. It's just a matter of time, right? So like once the eviction moratorium is lifted, I'm going to file the eviction. Um, you're going to owe double rent because I'm going to serve five day notice now. So you're going to owe double rent for every day beyond that fifth day for the next, you know, until you get evicted. Um, so it's not going away. Just work with them and try and Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome that you're taking the, you know, trying the approach of just trying to figure some stuff out. I'd say, um, I don't know if Linda from our property management company is on. We have a Pacific Rim property management up here in Seattle um, and we manage quite a few doors. Um, and we actually got everybody in for April, which we're really excited about. Uh, one of the things that I would say is just basically double check to make sure that you know what the laws are. There are some new eviction um, protections for tenants. Yeah, I'm here, Mike. Oh, right on. Linda, do you want to uh, just jump on and share what we know in Washington as to what the um, eviction rules are if you're a landlord? Sure, absolutely. So we know that we cannot issue a 14-day pay or vacate notice. We can't uh, go forward with evictions. We cannot issue an unlawful detainer. Uh, we can't even issue a notice to terminate tenancy, even if they are month to month. 
So just a lot of restrictions right now. So can we issue a notice um, for any reason, um, like, you know, they're ugly mm -hmm. or, you know, we're transitioning <laughs> or anything like that? The only exception is for health and safety reasons. And we have to stipulate that in writing what those conditions are. Interesting. Yeah. So then, um, Linda, what, what will we do? His, uh, his ammo for <laughs> tenants that don't pay. <laughs> I know. Well, I'm just thinking to myself, Corey, like, okay, well, you're now on my short list of people that as soon as this is done, you're getting a, a notice to vacate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's, um, I, I, yeah, <laughs> like it's it can be irritating for you know people who, you know, like rely on on rental income, but and like we do have to be sensitive during these times because you know people are losing jobs, people are being furloughed, and there's uncertainty and stuff like that. So, but it's frustrating, in my opinion. Absolutely. I mean, we had one tenant. Um, apparently, before we took over last month, they had outstanding orders, uh, maintenance orders, and she got fed up and took it out on us. And she said, well, if you can't fix it, I'm not going to pay rent. I know my rights. I'm like, that's awesome. I know your rights, too. And you have to pay rent. <laughs> so it's just really knowing all the tenant rights uh, within your state, uh, because they're going to issue, they're going to, they're going to issue those threats, and they're going to, you know, be unfounded threats. So yeah so linda um let's say somebody calls us today from one of our hundred some units and says uh sorry i'm gonna be a part of this movement i'm not paying rent screw you all the president <laughs> you know i mean that the point of this whole thing is that they're trying to make the president lock, unlock the whole nation every single state that's represented i think on this call from florida chicago all the way to hawaii and washington all have eviction protections as, as a result of the uh, cares act so as a result of that, uh, just curious, Linda, what would you do um, if somebody called? This doesn't put you on the spot. Yeah, I know. I thought about that too. And I know you gave me a heads up, but um, I think one of the concerns would be, or one thing I would do is just start out with, I'm sorry you feel that way. You know, obviously they're feeling something and they're feeling strongly enough that they want to be part of this movement. I don't know, maybe they're bored or something, but I would certainly tell them that they are still responsible to pay rent. Uh, let them know that after that June 4th moratorium is lifted, we are allowed to issue a 14 day pay or vacate. Um, and then do they have plans on where they're going to go at that time? That's great. I'm going to do a little shout out for Linda and Chris. The nice thing about them is that we've taken a very uh, relational approach to our property management. And so uh, we call tenants about five days prior to the end of the month just to check in, especially in light of the current job losses. Um, but what's really good too is that Linda and her husband, Christopher, are um, ex-police officers and ex-military. So they bring guns with them on property. Um, and that really is motivating. It's quite amazing. <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, Linda's doing a great job. Anybody else got any input on this particular topic or any insights or you've experienced this already and you've addressed this in some way? Steve Goodman. Unmute, Steve. Okay, there we go. All right, so I've been dealing with, uh, I've had investors with multiple properties. They've been calling me uh, and the big thing's been on forbearance and doing it. They want to know if they can do it, if they can take advantage of it. Um, and there's a lot of unsurety on it. And the big thing right now is no, it will affect, uh, their future when it comes to refinancing. And, uh, especially if they're wanting to do like cash out refinances, cash out refinances have taken a huge hit yeah. while your big banks are doing it. A lot of your small private aren't doing it now where the restrictions are charging you like five additional points. Yeah. Steve, um, can you do a quick definition? What is a forbearance? A forbearance is basically you're postponing your payments for an agreed amount, agreed period of time. Uh, now you can have different, uh, we've had like 2009, 2010, you know, we had different um, contracts put in place by the banks, but one of the ones, uh, and, and this comes down to the individual um, servicers that are handling the mortgages or the loans that you may have properties and investments on common one we're seeing right now is a three month forbearance. So we will not expect a mortgage payment for three months, but they are now expecting a full payment of those previous three months all at one lump sum. 
uh, which for most people that's, we, you know, realistically that's not gonna happen. So the other conclusion, a lot of them are putting a second addendum where they're looking at then doing a restructuring of your loan um, in three, three months time from now. Um, and that is coming down to individual servicers and mortgage, you know, people that are handling their uh, loans. Um, right now though, we're seeing a huge, if you're wanting to buy property or you're looking to get financing and it's not a hard money loan, but you're looking at the private or, uh, you know, banks, private lenders, things of that nature, uh, forbearance is huge. They're doing it. They're uh, basically shutting down. You have a lot of folks that are shutting down all their financing if they think you're doing a forbearance or if you've done one in the past and they're even looking back, they're, they're going to be looking back for a year's time. So I, I know folks that have, you know, oh, I have 10 properties or looking at doing that on one of their properties that will affect their future buying power unless they go hard money on something in the future. So that's now it's one of those, it's like, Hey, if you're thinking about it on something, um, I highly recommend not going into forbearance mm -hmm. and, you know, scrounging your money another way. That way you're not limiting yourself in the future when it comes to making your purchases. So that's just something I wanted to. That's awesome. And that's huge. That's important because that's the landlord perspective. It's like, Hey, you know, you're going to have somebody said that they they work for a commercial or a, a tent property management company in Seattle and they got 50% of rent. I mean, landlords and uh, property owners, you can't afford to pay your own mortgage. So eventually the whole building's going to go into foreclosure. Then everybody loses out because now every tenant has to vacate because now the whole building is in foreclosure. It takes some time for that to happen, of course, but yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting. Um, what we're going to start up this week is um, we're not going to keep going on too much longer. We're going to end with uh, gets and gots, but um, we're going to start up a Facebook conversation in light of all that's changing. So um, we'll keep you because we have your email addresses. We'll uh, shoot you that Facebook uh, page. Um, we're trying to figure out a good name for it, by the way. So if you've got an idea, um, email it to us or throw it in the chat. But we just want to create a Facebook conversation all week long so we can keep this going. Some of you have some great questions throughout the week that you're struggling through or thinking through. Uh, this is one of those topics that some of us are really trying to figure out. So um, let us just wrap it up kind of right here on that particular topic and know that this week, I think a lot of us are going to be watching because those of us who are landlords, uh, it's a stressful time. I mean, you want your heart goes out to those who are unemployed. But at the same time, your heart's aching because you know you got a mortgage payment to make on a building that you need the cash flow to come in. You know, so it's a real catch-22, and there are no protections for landlords right now. And so that's something that, as landlords, you know, we'll probably want to be watching because if this goes on for too much longer, what could happen? And what they're saying is, if this movement of don't pay rent in May seems to get a, everybody gets away with it then they're going to do it in June and then the momentum builds and pretty soon you've got, you know, a million people not paying rent come July. And then now you've got buildings upon buildings who mortgages are now delayed or in forbearance. So, I mean, the domino effect of that could be horrendous. So something to watch and something to see if we need to all get involved in some way. But um, for now, we'd love to have you guys to just kind of uh, let us know if you're interested in that Facebook. We're going to send you that and then we could just keep the conversation. But let's end with gets and gots. This has been a great conversation. It's been going so fast. I got a ton out of today. So thanks for all the participation. But um, so uh, the gets is basically you need something. Uh, you need a private money lender. You need a referral for a designer. You need, um, you need extra coffee. I mean, if you need something, that's what the gets. I need to get this. Uh, if you've got something, you've got a property, uh, like last week, Greg's like, hey, I've got some apartments that I could wholesale. Uh, do you have something that you want to share? Uh, this would be the opportunity as well. You're welcome to jump on to just share it right now or throw it in the chat real quick. But uh, anybody have a get or a got as we kind of wind this week down? I'll jump back in. Yeah, I still have those um, two units at Harbor Lights. Uh, nice. Um, I, yeah, I'm still, i am got a few more things to finish sorting out there, but uh, they should be available for assignment in the next, you know, week or two, I think. Um, if anybody's interested, email me the chat. My email is in the chat. I also, if anybody's interested in commercial real estate brokerage, um, me and my wife have a really strong uh, connection and a lot of leverage with Sperry Commercial Properties and can hook you up with a That's franchise. Cool. If anybody wants to do commercial real estate on Maui right now and be quarantined in Maui, he's the guy to hook up with. 
Greg's got it. <laughs> Actually, anywhere. Um, it, we're, they're, they're national. And also, um, we're looking for deals always. So if you got deals on Maui, we're looking for flips. Um, we do a lot of co-hole sales. When people get leads on Maui, don't have buyers. And then we do, um, we buy buy and holds and we wholesale hold and, uh, buy and holds and flips. Right on. Well, Greg, if you don't get those placed, um, I think I've got a couple of the physicians that would love those Maui apartments. Those are just, a, those are a great deal. So, um, yeah, that? feel free to give them my email, tell them to reach out. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That's super great. Anybody else? Good, great, good gets, gots. Greg, tell, tell Brandon we want a shot at his next mobile home park. <laughs> I think he's got one under contract right now. Should be closing soon. Oh, okay. Nice. Nice, nice. Uh, Carolyn needs to get a private money lender in Hawaii, 185K uh, willing to joint venture. Um, I know Carolyn personally, the, her and her husband are absolutely people of integrity. Uh, and so if you've got some cash and you're looking for a partner, uh, it looks like they want their JV as well. Um, Carolyn, can you throw your email address onto the uh, chat right there? And then if you're interested in just kind of reaching out to her, um, uh, connect with her. Of course, anytime you do a JV with anybody, do your due diligence. Um, you know, Corey and I had to date for a long time before I JV'd with him on anything. Uh, always take your time. Uh, I always say the only ship that doesn't sail is a partnership. Uh, and that's usually true for most occasions. But when you really lay everything out and really outline things and you do your background checks, um, partnerships can be some of the most powerful ways to, to succeed, especially through the season like the pandemic. So right on, Carolyn threw her email in there in case anybody's curious about what that looks like. Um, and maybe if there's a couple people that want to hui together, um, hui in English means uh, partner together, then uh, just let Carolyn know. Sorry, sometimes only the Hawaiian words come out and I can't figure out what the English word is. Anyway, Nicole, gonna... you, yeah, you may want to tell everyone how they can get a copy of the video they want to know if this yeah. recording. Yeah, we're fundraising for the homeless. So $1,000 a copy. Uh, <laughs> the Keikoa Coffee Fund. Uh, nah. Well, um, yeah, we'll, it's recording now and then our team will figure out if we can put it on the Facebook. Um, this was awesome. Today was fantastic. Again, throw some questions on there for... Um, some topics that you want to hit next week. But anybody else, you get something, you got something. That's so Hawaii. What you get, bro? What you get? I get a PML yeah, what, opportunity, too. You get one opportunity. Richie, go for it. Yeah, just PML opportunity. Um, got quite a few deals going on right now. Still How much? A little bit of capital. Uh, doing minimum of 50000 but we, we can take more. Okay. There you go. Okay, reach. You're offering equity or what? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, I gotta take my first call. Yeah. Twenty-five <laughs> percent interest, bro. We in. Sign us up. <laughs> no problem. All day. <laughs> right on. Anybody else on something you got? Anybody get? I got four. I got four deals. If you guys, private money lenders, anyone want to join in on a flip, tag along, let me know. Okay. Indar's got some stuff too. Um, anytime anybody ever comes across a wholesale on this network, please, if you don't have somewhere to place it, uh, we'll get that Facebook started this week. And if you can post that wholesale opportunity, uh, we have people from around the country. It could be a really cool opportunity to have somebody jump in or place a deal. So if you've got anything in Chicago, Ohio, Seattle, Hawaii, uh, Florida, uh, and you have a wholesale deal. I think we could probably get a place within this group, which would be super fun. Um, but any other final thoughts? Uh, we're kind of a little bit over time. Definitely want to respect everybody's time on this uh, May 1st. Cassie's rubbing her eyes. She's like, oh my gosh, this took so long today. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't eat. That's a problem with Zoom, yeah, you could get so called out. Actually, Cassie had some great questions. I hope we answered most of them today. If not, uh, definitely we'll chime in for next week too. But um, so I, I think we'll wrap it up here. It's, uh, it's been a great conversation. Just thank you so much, uh, Jasmine, Greg, Tay, Keoni, Ashley, Josiah, everybody, all of you for joining us. Corey and I are super excited that we have the opportunity to host something like this where it's an ongoing conversation. Um, again, we, we, are, we are doing this more as a, 
an opportunity to have a conversation going and not have anybody say, hey, no one's the guru here. Um, and so we're just raising want to make sure that we're, we're giving true value to. So in the Facebook group, you know, like uh, matching people who have deals with people who have money that want to invest or, you know, and we're solving problems together. And I want to say thank you to um, basically the, the Rosen House clan, <laughs> Justin, Tyler, and Scott. Um, they're really in the, you know, um, taking care of uh, kind of starting this. Like Kiko and I tend to like start things and then like have to figure out a way to, you know, clean up the mess. But we're, we're, I think we're figuring it out slowly. And uh, uh, we'll be starting that Facebook page to keep it organized. And, and uh, Justin Tyler and Scott have been huge help. And thank you guys so much. And hopefully uh, continue the conversation uh, over on Facebook. Absolutely. We, we do need a name, though. So if you guys have any suggestions, you know, like, um, I, we don't know. We, we want this to be like a, a true mastermind of some sort and um, keeping the culture that Keiko and I have worked so hard to um, build in our, our respective markets that we're in. And that is people with abundant mindsets, they're not afraid to share the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, and, you know, just friendly. And, you know, it's never business to us. It's never just business. You know, it's always, we have fun, right? So, and we, we like to do business with people who we want to do business with. And we're, we're all in a fortunate yes. position that we don't have to work with anybody that we don't have to, right? Yes. Greg, you got to give some incentive for that name. Yeah. So how about if uh, if anybody comes up with the name and they're the winning name, uh, they get one free week hanging out with Corey. Hey, hey Greg. <laughs> Actually, we probably pay people to do that, but you know, something like that. <laughs> Greg, Greg, hey Greg, you will Brandon mind if we're called Biggest Pockets? <laughs> <laughs> right, buy them. I like it. <laughs> Set. <laughs> right on, everybody. Um, thank you so much. Have a great week. We're going to do this again next week. We sure appreciate all of you. Uh, stay in touch. We'll catch you on Facebook. Um, hopefully, we'll get that all set up by tomorrow. Right, Justin? <laughs> all right. <Good> night, right <laughs> now. No. <laughs> all right. Okay. Take care. Have a great one. Uh, we'll hang out here for a few minutes in, any, in case anyone's got any sidebar conversations, questions, anything like that. But Otherwise, thanks so much. Have a super great Friday, great weekend, and uh, we'll keep the conversation going. Aloha. Aloha, guys. Cheats. Mahalo, everyone. Take care. I'm going to turn the recording off.